Hello. In this podcast, I will be covering my student choice project for Art 391. Uh, My student choice project is Rachel Roish. An introduction to me before getting to my podcast topic, my name is Callum Hush. I am a sophomore studying a BFA in Interaction Design and about to declare a minor in Audio Design and Production at SUNY Oswego. I am from Homer, New York, which is right outside of Cortland. and I chose to take this course uh, as my previous art history courses piqued my interest in the area. I enjoy learning the history and uh, being able to place the artwork and the influences on a geographical level. I'm going to be covering three main subtopics in this podcast, starting off with the historical context, visual analysis, and then iconographic analysis. Rachel Roish is a Dutch painter who lived from 1664 to 1750. Her work's most notable elements are floral and botanical still lifes, rich vibrant hues, and realism. A fun fact about Rachel Roish is that she sold more paintings than Rembrandt in her time. One of Rachel Roish's most prominent influences and supporters of her art career was her father, Frederick Roish. Dr. Frederick Roish was a scientist and a professor of anatomy and botany. He was also known as the chief anatomist of the Amsterdam Surgeons Guild for almost 60 years. Under the guidance of her father, Rachel Roish was able to study botany and living creatures and look into the history and catalog of them. She also helped him catalog and record his own records. From her experience with helping her father with his studies and learning more about the world, observing it, uh, she created still lives and renderings of her natural environment. Her father was very supportive of her art, and at age 15, she began an apprenticeship with still life painter William Van Alist. Throughout the course of her life, she ended up making over 250 paintings. It is theorized that the Ottoman Empire brought the tulips first to the Netherlands before anyone else, but that is not confirmed. And as this tulip stock market began to grow in this time of economic prosperity, in February 1637, this stock market that was created with the tulips began to crash as investors no longer saw the value matching up with the product. And they began to sell their uh, shares and ownership And by the end of the crash, tulip bulbs had lost 90% of their earlier value. In the 17th century Netherlands, where Rachel Roish grew up, there was an increase of economic prosperity as they had just gained independence from Spain. Previous to this 17th century golden age, Artwork in this location was often very religious based, had religious subjects and meaning, um, and that was no longer the case. The artwork began to move towards portraits, still lives, landscapes, and began to be used as aesthetic decor within the home and public spaces. Patronage began to increase, as well as personal commission uh, market. There was especially an increase in move towards floral artwork in the Dutch Golden Age. One of the flowers that Rachel Roish often includes in her work is the tulip. The tulip had a lot of value due to the short uh, blooming season that it had. 
previous to the Dutch Golden Age and the flower craze within the artwork there, the tulip has been shown in artwork of multiple medias uh, in the Ottoman Empire around the 16th century. In the Ottoman Empire, some of the mediums that they put the tulip on range from ceramics, carpets, tapestries, paintings, and other textiles. The Ottomans believed that the tulip stood for beauty, love, and abundance, and that it was also a symbol that could deter more negative energies and evil intentions. So how does all of this information tie into the work of Rachel Roish? Well, let's dive into one of her pieces and find out. Rachel Roish's painting, Still Life with Flowers in a Glass Vase, is dated around 1650 to 1683. The background of the painting and the stand or plane which the vase sits upon both very dark, almost black backgrounds. Her choice of subject matter stands out on these dark backgrounds as they are significantly brighter and very vibrant. The majority of the piece is extremely bright and very warm toned with half of the flowers being a shade of red, most being bright shades of vermilion, others being very tinted baby pink. She achieves her shades of yellows and browns by tinting an Indian yellow, and her greens and blues lean towards a phalo shade and a cobalt blue. The tulips that she features at the top of this painting are red and white, with the white sections sort of flowing organically across the red in streaks. This type of coloration is known as variegation in tulips. Sitting in front of these tulips, a tall, thin stem of baby's breath reaches up with the biggest uh, clump at the top and then very tiny ones towards the bottom of the stem before it is hidden by the other flowers in front of them. In the center of the painting, there are four main carnations. The top one is white, and the bottom three are light pink. The fluffiest one is the white one, and then the second grouping, the one to the right, is more open than the one to the left of it. And then finally the last one below that has started to close up and is drooping the most. Finally, making a circle back to the plane which the vase sits upon, on top of this slab, there are two red flowers that sort of rest upon it. One that is drooping down from the vase, which is why I said sorta, and then the other one that rests on this plane. There's also one piece of wheat that droops down uh, next to the other flower that droops down, and then another piece of wheat with the other flower to the left, which is resting on the slab. On the far lower right of this painting, there is a snail climbing up the slab, making its way towards the vase and the flowers. Um, there is a caterpillar climbing up one of the stems that is drooping down, meeting halfway towards the bottom base of the vase, and another little insect, uh, Sorry, there's another spider on the slab right next to the 
left side of the drooping piece of wheat. The experience in the field of botany that Rachel Roish has really carries over into her paintings as there is an insane amount of attention to detail in this artwork. So what was Rachel Roish trying to communicate by including all of these elements in her work? What do they all mean? Well, within this painting, Still Life of Flowers in a Glass Vase, Rachel Roish shows ideas of beauty, death, and decay. Going back to the historical context section, the idea of beauty, life, and death uh, shown in flowers was seen in the Ottoman Empire. But a lot of the art in the Dutch Golden Age had previously been influenced from a lot of Christian and religious ideals. One of the elements that stands out to me is the snail included in this piece. It is very isolated by itself and the act of it making its way up to all of the decaying matter to thrive and gain its nutrients off of the decaying matter uh, shows significance. The species of the snail, which I may not pronounce correctly, appears to be the Theba pisana. Snails in Europe previously had been seen as a symbol of death, often appearing on gravestones. Um, and this idea originates from a belief that snails can represent the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, this is since snails have a very long sleep period. Some snails can sleep for up to three years. Um, I remember seeing at the dining hall on one of their little fun facts. Another thing that would awaken the snail, other than their choice of their sleep cycle, would be the rain, since they enjoy moisture. It is a very odd dynamic of life and death that the snail could represent, um, depending on its context. Since the Dutch Golden Age was moving away from this type of belief and those ideas, Roish may have intended the inclusion of the snail to emphasize the death of the flowers and alluding to the full cycle of life as the flowers die. The snail is repurposing them and benefiting from their death. Um, so that connects to the beauty aspect as well, where these beautiful plants are dying and they're losing their beauty, but could it also be beautiful for another living form to gain from that? Going back to the most contrasting section of the painting, the clump grouping of white and pink carnations, uh, the various stages that she shows in the four different flowers is showing the stages of decay. Within the traditional Christian perspective on art symbolism, carnations had been seen as a symbol of the crucifixion and death of Jesus Christ. Uh, Roish may be comparing the carnations gradually dying to the event of the crucifixion, um, not necessarily to the story, but to the idea of losing life very slowly and the struggle of that, the pain of that. 
Finally, making a full circle around to the historical context um, and the meanings that the Ottoman Empire had for tulips, uh, which were beauty, abundance, love, and uh, a ward against negative forces, the value that tulips had, the beauty of the flower, the good fortune that was tied to them because of their value, um, is shown in Rachel Roish's piece with a very minimal bloom and the short life of the flower. The tulip, with its short life, has been alluded to mortality and eventually the final judgment in the Christian perspective. But once again, that idea has been shifted away from at this time and translating it into the new ideas, Roish may be representing the cycle of life and bringing the idea of beauty uh, back in as the Ottoman Empire showed in their work um, and reminding the viewer of the temporary lives of these highly sought out extremely aesthetic and beautiful flowers and especially with the Netherlands being a huge market for these flowers it would make sense for it to have that trade value of ideas. For a simplification of that, um, a common interpretation of scholars and art critics of Roche's flower paintings um, is under an idea of vanitas, I believe is how you say it, um, which is a word um, taken from a passage in the Bible and once and going back to my cycle of life comment uh, it is a reminder that beauty fades and all living things must die it is inevitable and well still lives often show the most beautiful points of these life forms. Um, this idea of beauty fading and life fading uh, warns the viewer of it and makes you be a little more grateful for it and to not be attached to it as much. The paintings made by Rachel Roish are very beautiful, vibrant, and the attention to detail that she has, especially being able to apply her experience in the botanical studies, uh, just elevates her work to another level and shows why she was such a successful artist. I hope that you as the listener gained a new perspective to observe art in, especially still lives, um, and learning all of the geographical influences, the life influences, supporters, and the hidden messages within a painting that many just see as flowers on a slab that you are able to go and observe other pieces of art by different artists and try to figure out what message they have within it. I really enjoy Rachel's work and it was really, um, it was a very unique learning experience that has benefited me a lot. Thank you for listening.